Hello, everybody. I am Lana from Tell Me Baby. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for our TMB TV series, Pregnancy, Birth and Beyond. Tonight's TMB TV is brought to you by award-winning Tommy Tippy, who make the parenthood roller coaster ride just a little bit easier for parents around the world. We are so happy to be back with Tyler, a midwife who's based in Sydney. Hello, Tyler. Thank you so much for joining us again tonight. Hey, thanks so much for having me. I absolutely love these. So before we get into everybody's questions, um, one thing that has been asked quite a lot and a common question that we've been getting is how can mums-to-be prepare for breastfeeding prior to birth? This is, yeah, like you said, one of the most common questions and something that can make mums quite anxious. And I would say the number one way to prepare is to start to familiarise yourself with your breasts and start to know how they function, how they feel. I would 100% recommend expressing from 36 weeks so you can start to sort of see um, things happening and really get that connection in your mind um, that you are going to be capable of doing this, starting to build that confidence. Also exposing yourself to different forms of media. So watching YouTube videos about attachment. Global Health Media has amazing videos about expressing an attachment all for free. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of asking people about their experiences and really starting to get all that to go into your mind um, so that when the opportunity comes or when the time comes to breastfeed, it's not something that's completely new to you. Yeah, absolutely. That's really great advice. So our first question is from Alice and she's asked us, how will I know if my waters are broken? So this is a really common question and something we get. A lot of pregnancy is quite normal, especially a lot of watery discharge. So often women will confuse this with their waters. That being said, if you do experience a pop or a large gush, um, if it's soaking a pad and soaking your underwear, soaking your sheets, this is quite likely a confirmation that your waters have broken. If you're uncertain, you can always go in to be assessed, but have the confidence that generally, if it's a constant fluid leaking, you're changing your pads regularly, that this is most likely your waters. However, if it's discharge that's watery that you don't need to really wear a pad for, um, then, it, then it's unlikely. Mine never broke, so I never got that. So <laughs> for me, it's foreign. <laughs> yeah, wow. We, um, we have a question now from Ash, um, who's asked, how can my partner prepare to support me in labour? I think birth for partners can be something that is so scary and foreign and something that partners really worry about. And I believe a lot of the conversations need to be had before the birth room. What are your expectations of your partner? Do you want him to massage you? Do you want him to be offering you water? Do you want them or her to, you know, play some nice music? Do you want them to leave you completely alone? Um, it's sort of starting to create these expectations together, building tools together, what feels good for you um, before you even get there. Because if you've done none of the work and everything's foreign, emotions are running high, often I find partners can sort of go into themselves and just get overwhelmed. You can attend classes together, read books together, really make it, you know, you're in this together, you're about to come parents together. So really making sure that, um, yeah, that, that you're preparing together as well. You're not alone in it. And we know men aren't mind readers, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You've got to spell it out. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So Holly has a question um, and she's asking, is it normal for babies' movements to decrease towards the end of pregnancy because there's less room? So this is a common misconception and something that can actually be particularly dangerous. A lot of women have the idea that towards the end, because baby's growing so big, you're not going to feel movements, when actually this is the time that you need to be paying most close attention to your movements. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to get to know your baby? Does your baby move after you've had you, your breakfast or, of course, at night as you're trying to settle down to sleep? If these change at all, if they decrease, if they feel less, Trust your intuition, call your birth unit and get it checked out. Your movement should not decrease at all. Your baby's pattern should still stay very familiar towards the end. And, you know, it's, you know, your body best. So you might be able to pick something up that baby might be, not be doing as well. So definitely paying attention and trusting your intuition is important. Yeah, absolutely. 
Okay. Sophie wants to know how long will the labor be? She, uh, if she's anxious that it will last for a long time, what are some of the things that she can do to be um, shortening that labor or easing those concerns? So this is another great question and something that is asked constantly. And I would say this is a very logical way to approach labor. And labor, unfortunately, is not a logical process at all. Ask any doctor or midwife, you can never have any expectations because every woman's different. And just when you think you've got it and you think something's going to happen, the complete opposite will happen. That being said, I say that you should be giving birth in the same environment that you conceive this baby in. That is comfortable, dark and dim, um, full of love. You know, it should be a really intimate time for your, with you and your partner. And that's okay to be. You should be massaging, whispering, soft touches. One thing I absolutely love to do in a labor is talk about when the couple met, how they met. The first time they said, I love you. What it was like when, um, you know, they found out they were pregnant together. Getting these hormones going and looking at this as a really positive, intimate, connecting experience rather than this fearful, terrifying experience is something that's going to make it go a lot quicker. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I like to say is you should look at the contractions as an interesting sensation that is going to bring baby out versus something that's going to cause you pain that you're not going to make it through. They're very different energies um, and trying to keep that mindset. Mindset is everything. Um, so there's some things that can shorten it. Physically, though, being mobile is can help shorten it. Expressing breast milk, um, nipple stimulation, relaxing as much as possible is everything um, and letting your body work for you, not against you. Yeah, yeah that's really great advice. Okay, so we've got another one here. When is a good time to come in or slash call the hospital? <laughs> So I think this is probably the hardest thing to decide for first time mums as they're suddenly faced with the unknown. When's it going to happen? What's going to happen? When do I call? The general advice that we give is um, when you're having three contractions every three minutes. Um, so all like three and 10 minutes approximately, if you can remember that. And they're lasting for a minute, eight, a minute long. And they're nice and regular. So commonly we'll get that call when labor first starts and it's okay to touch base with your hospital, let them know that you're laboring and get some advice. Um, but if you're really wanting your best chance at that normal birth and labor, staying home as long as possible and trying to just reassure yourself at home can be really important. You've got all your comforts there, your shower, food, things like that. So, but once things heat up, we say labor is a bit like a song. So if you're talking through your contractions and you're not really making too much, Always labors not the beginning, but as it starts to sort of heat up and establish, you'll have to, you won't be able to talk, you'll go inwards, you'll start making noises, you'll go really into that primordial state, and this would be a good time to go to the hospital. Mm -hmm. For your second baby, however, I would be very careful because <laughs> there's a lot of babies being born in cars. So um, with that second baby, so with that one sort of once things start and they're regular, you probably want to get in there quickly. <laughs> and is that something that's very common that the second pregnancies can be a lot faster when it comes to labor? Definitely your body sort of clicks in and it remembers, ah, I've been here before. Mm -hmm. And we have that concept of never trust like a mum who's having a baby for the second time, never turn your back because that <laughs> baby will be coming out. So uh, we have to be really careful. It can be quick. Um, you so on the pulse. Just knowing your body and knowing that. Yeah. Okay. So we've got another one here. Um, what are some items that you wouldn't necessarily think that are good to have in labour? So the best things to have that you wouldn't think of are things that make you yourself comfortable, whether it's a moisturiser that you love or a lotion where the smell is really familiar, um, clothes that you're super comfortable in, or even a blanket that you might like fairy lights or even like those sort of fake flickering candles you can get um, essential oils anything that's really going to create like I said that cozy environment that oxytocin rich environment so instead of thinking about sort of like logically what things you might like medically need and exact yeah. items it's like what's going to make me feel most at home um, that's what I would recommend those comforts yeah Okay, what natural pain reliefs can I use in the hospital? 
this is a great question and something that I sort of look at as being like a step up system. So um, water immersion is one of the most obvious and useful techniques. If your birth unit, if you've done a tour, if you know about it, if they have baths, I would definitely recommend when you call up to ask for a room with a bath, if not all of them have them, because water immersion can really help in labor. Using the shower can be really important. Mobility, you'll find that a lot of birth rooms are stocked with yoga balls, mats, bean bags. Um, you can even use the birth bed. They're very versatile. They lift up and down, trying to use that to lean against, you know, and sort of use your body to move baby down can be great for relief. Heat packs are amazing. Even cool packs, um, people will often use combs and sort of squeeze down on them during contractions just to sort of disassociate that pain a little bit. Um, but it's getting a little bit creative, like, like with textures and things like that. Yeah. This leads into a question I, I think that um, we've just had from Laura on Facebook who she's just asked mm -hmm. if she's going to be a support person for her best mm. friend due any day now wow. best friend. Um, is there any advice that you have for um, a support person yeah I think for a support person you might not think it but first and foremost you do need to prioritize yourself um, so you do need to make sure that you are eating, you have slept appropriately, um, you know, you're using the bathroom as you need because you can't really be there and you'll burn out really quickly if you're giving 100% straight away. That's what we find. Everyone comes in, they get very excited, they're supporting, supporting, but around the four to five hour mark, they sort of peter out. So making sure that you're taking regular breaks, time outside of the room to sort of ground yourself can be really important. Mm -hmm. Looking up massage techniques is you know always going to win in a birth room um looking at sort of affirmations words of comfort having those discussions of well what do you normally like um when you're uncomfortable how can i support you making sure you come with the snacks and uh things like that as well we'll never go on this yeah and i guess it goes back to that point that you were saying before about how a partner can prepare helping you for labor mm -hmm. it's having that conversation and knowing what their expectations mm -hmm. of you are going into mm -hmm. the room yeah okay so we have a couple about breastfeeding um when people are talking about breastfeeding what does it mean when they say drain the breast yeah so this is a common expression and something we use to um sort of teach women is that when you're feeding um especially once your milk's come in so this is around that day three day four mark that when you're feeding you want to feel that your breast has been drained a common concern women have is how do I know baby's getting it? There's definitely a lot of ways to tell, but one is that your breasts are being drained on both sides. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're not feeling like that's happening, you can express in the shower or you can use a pump yourself. So our partner, Tommy Tippy has a really affordable one. You can do your research and see what works well for you. Um, but women will, you know, use that just for comfort. Um, there you do have to be careful with oversupply and things like that. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, you just want to feel like that breast has gone soft. And that's why we know the ducks have emptied and the milk has sort of gotten to baby. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I guess leading on from that, you're talking about supply. We've got a question here saying that I'm worried my baby will be hungry those first few days before my milk comes in. Will my baby be getting what he or she needs? Uh, you're not alone with this uh, concern or and this question. Every mum worries about whether they will have enough. Um, and what I like to affirm to them is when you were growing your baby, you didn't have to think, is this an arm? Is this a leg? What am I growing now? Am I growing it right? It sort of just happened. And it was that trust that, you know, my body is made to do this and it will be okay. And this is very familiar with breastfeeding. What you want to know is it's natural for baby to be very hungry in those first two days to bring in your supply. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a loop and it's a cycle and it's a supply and demand. And if you can just trust, I describe it as a mountain, those first three days you're climbing up that mountain it is going to be a bit difficult um baby might cluster feed want to feed every hour but that's all to bring your milk in and ensure that by day three you've got a really good thing going where feeds will shorten a little bit you'll have bigger gaps in between them and you'll settle into that routine but that can't happen without baby demanding all this milk and your body to know that baby's been born baby's demanding this i have to get making yeah yeah absolutely 
Okay. Have we got one here around breast pads. Should I buy them and should I actually be taking them to the hospital with me? Mm -hmm. So one of the main reasons breast pads are used is because of leakage. So once your milk comes in, um, it can be often that you will get that leakage and mums can be a bit self-conscious. So I would say it all depends on how long you're going to be in hospital. If you're going to be there sort of that one night or that five nights, it's a bit different. Um, I would say they don't hurt to pack. Uh, you can use either reusable ones or you can buy disposable ones. So again, our partner Tommy Tippy has um, ones that are disposable, that are breathable and non-slip. You can do your research, have a look around what's going to work best for you, try a few different things. Um, it doesn't hurt to have in the in your like labour or baby bag. It's not going to go to waste, um, you know. And if it makes you feel a bit secure having it there, then I say why not? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we've got one from um, Helen who came through on Instagram who's asked, how many scans do you normally have in pregnancy? Mm -hmm. So this is going to differ, but for a normal pregnancy where there's no risk factors, typically you will get two to three. So this really doesn't sound like a lot, but what you will get is a dating scan. However, if you're sure about your period, it's regular and you know um, the date of your last period, then you don't even need this. Um, next will be the nuchal translucency. So that's the one from 11 to 13 weeks. And that generally they'll test for the nasal bone, which when there's an absence of that, it can indicate Down syndrome. So that's people will generally refer to that one as like the, the test for Down syndrome, but it does test for other trisomies and um, trisomy abnormalities as well as um, structural defects. So that's that one. And then the big one um, is sort of your 19 week, 20 week, that'll be your morphology. So that's where a lot of people find out the gender. Um, that'll be that scan and that'll be the big overall look at everything, baby's heart, you know, all the organs and making sure um, that everything's well there. Awesome. Okay. We've got so many coming in. This is fantastic, guys. Um, first pregnancy, 26 weeks now, very anxious about the whole process. Any coping mechanisms? Yeah, I think, first of all, it's recognising that that you are pregnant, again, in a crazy time of COVID where things are rapidly changing and there's a lot of uncertainty. So I think it's important to realise it's okay to be anxious, it's normal, and it's not going to mean everything's going to go bad just because you're scared. I think the first, first and foremost, it's having that support network of people you can rely on, talking to mums, making sure that you and your partner are constantly expressing these concerns and addressing them together, you're a team doing this together. Um, but then it would be getting informed as possible. So reading, 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 or, you know, whatever media that works best for you, if it's watching videos, the more things you can sort of consume. And of course, try and go for the more positive ones if, if you are concerned. Um, but feeling that empowerment is probably the best thing that you can do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Nadisha on Facebook has asked us, I've been diagnosed with gestational diabetes. So is there anything I have to keep in mind at the time of labour? So the biggest thing you can do for your baby with gestational diabetes is expressing. So from 36 weeks, get on expressing and start to build a little store because the risk with gestational diabetes is that baby will have unstable sugar levels after birth. So in terms of labour, you can generally drink and eat as normal. They'll just test your sugar regularly. But for baby, you wanted to make sure you have a bit of a supply if baby sugars do drop. Um, and that way you're able to give the option of giving express breast milk rather than having to go straight to formula. It just allows you a bit more choice. Mm -hmm. So that's the best thing that you can do um, with gestational diabetes. Yeah. Okay. That adds to another question that we've just had. So should you eat during labor or will this make you feel worse? So I would definitely recommend eating during labour. Um, of course, unless you're going into labour and you have a planned cesarean and that's going to be an operation, that's a whole other sort of field. But I would definitely recommend, especially in early labour, because early labour, getting to that four centimetres, everyone thinks it's about like four and above, but that four centimetres, that early labour is the hardest part. And that's when you need as much rest and as much, you know, nutrition, hydration and things as you can. 
you'll actually find once you get above that four centimeters that your digestive system will say, ah, uh -uh, no more. And your body will tell you to stop eating because it diverts its blood flow to the uterus, things that are going to be of higher priority. Um, but if you've been in early labor and sort of fasted all day and then you're into the active labor where you really need that energy, you're going to sort of almost fall flat. Um, so I think it's very important to try and continue even if it's a little amount and knowing that it's a possibility very likely that you'll throw up but us as midwives we sort of get excited when women throw up because we're like, okay like something's starting of course we can offer you anti nausea medication and things like that but it does sort of go in the back of our head right like we're getting there something's happening that good old transition phase <laughs> yeah <laughs> Um, okay, so Megan's got a good one for us. How important or beneficial are pelvic floor exercises when it comes to preparing for labour? So I would say if you're super concerned about pelvic floor, if you're already having major issues with incontinence, it can never hurt to see a physio. Most hospitals have like um, women's health physios specifically. Mm -hmm. So I would say if you have those real concerns, then you should, you know, it definitely wouldn't hurt to see them. Um, but you definitely have to consider them because it's not straight away that you're going to sort of pay for the cost of childbirth on your pelvic floor. It's going to be when you're 70. Mm -hmm. um, so making sure that you are practicing them, but not going too crazy as well. You don't want a tight pelvic floor. So um, I would say sort of do your own research Search, um, look at some government websites you know what what's the recommendation and and go from there but really knowing you don't have to worry you can do it during like um, during pregnancy but the real time comes postpartum where you're wanting to really get on top of that re-strengthen let your body heal and recover um, because that's going to stead you well as you age yeah absolutely so we were talking about water before um, so Sammy <laughs> said speaking of baths um, she's interested in a water birth. Is there anything mm. to be aware of or any advice relating to this that you can offer? I think, yeah, with a water birth, advice or things to be aware of. Um, there is certain criteria that hospital will recommend for water birth. So some of it, sometimes they do have like a weight limit um, or they do have like if you're having a premature birth, they're not necessarily going to advise it. So mm -hmm. I'd say look at that criteria so you're not disheartened if, you know, the hospital's not necessarily going to recommend it. That mm -hmm. being said, you can say this is my preference and override it. You do have a choice. Mm -hmm. um, we can only recommend recommend and advise uh, but I would say you know the best thing would be to sort of layer pain relief methods so use the bath but also you know have your partner massage your back at the same time have sort of essential oils to make you feel calm get a head massage or use acupressure um, I find it pain relief works best when it's when it's layered and it's sort of coming at you from all angles um, so I would say yes water birth but look at other things that you can use with that yeah for sure Okay, so Jack on Facebook, she has asked, um, she's interested in hypno or calm birthing. Mm. Where can I start finding out more about this? Mm -hmm. So I would say, obviously, things are changing with time of COVID, but try and find someone locally. It's about empowering yourself to read reviews. And if you can do in-person training, obviously, with your 1.5, that's recommended um but just doing some research there's some great books if you just look up yeah calm birth um some great australian companies that are doing it um and that are still offering classes uh there's a lot of online ones too that are often slightly more affordable so they yeah they do come at that cheaper price um but you can also read yourself and if you're really committed to looking at sort of breathing techniques in labor positive affirmations you're also able to you know, develop a lot of those skills through your own research too. Yeah, absolutely. That helped me so much. Mm. So much. Um, so Carol has asked us, does your body know how to produce milk as quickly if you have a C-section? Mm -hmm. So yeah, this is a great question. We do occasionally find a delay um, with milk coming in with a cesarean section. I did say that three to four days for milk to come in. And so we find with cesarean, sometimes it's on, on the fourth day. Um, but with that, I would say your biggest friend is stimulation. So if you had a pump before, you know you're going for a cesarean, um, be expressing like right up until you, like from 36 weeks up until you have the cesarean, because then you've already told your brain a baby's coming and a baby needs this milk. 
milk. So let's get started. And that being said, you know, in the hospital afterwards, you can express regularly to stimulate that supply. So there's definitely a lot of things within your control that you can start um, activating now so that it won't be too much of an issue. Yeah, of course. Um, so Adele has asked us, she said that she has been told at her 20 week scan that she has an anterior placenta. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that she should be concerned about at this stage? So it's definitely not a concern. Um, it's, it's just a variation of normal. But one thing we do say is you will feel movements differently. And we find women who have had two or three babies and suddenly have an anterior placenta get very confused why they're not feeling movements. An anterior placenta can often cushion the movements. So it's just making sure, you know, if you are concerned, have a sort of a low threshold for getting it checked out um, because they can feel cushioned. You have a big meaty placenta there cushioning baby's movements. So yeah. it's just thinking about it physiologically. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so Sheridan has asked us, will I be able to tell the difference between Braxton Hicks and real contractions? Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, so Braxton Hicks are painless. So that's the easiest way to describe it. They can be uncomfortable, your belly goes tight and they do last, but there'll be no pain associated with them. Contractions, however, do have that like period cramp like sensation with them um, and they will be intense um, and you will have to sort of catch your breath and um, I know it's hard because a lot of people are like oh you'll know when you know you know um, and that's not very helpful for someone who's just sitting there waiting so it's just trusting your body that knowing like when the contractions come they're doing something they're opening a cervix so you're going to feel that yeah yeah for sure okay so Rach has asked us um, do I choose a C-section over having vacuum or forceps? Do vacuum and forceps cause major problems that could affect baby after birth? I think this is a great question and something that's really interesting to explore. Mm -hmm. um, there are so many different, like with instrumental birth, there's so many different elements that you have to consider. And this is where I would empower you so much to do your own research. Mm -hmm. So in terms of if you're wanting to talk straight up vacuum versus forceps, Forceps is more likely to cause pelvic floor damage. But that being said, it's where your baby is in the pelvis when a forceps delivery is occurring. Um, and with vacuum, that's more likely to cause like what we call like, you know, little like a bruise on baby's head that can have complications. So it's weighing that up. Um, I think it's all about considering risk and what level of risk that you're comfortable with. So it's looking at the statistics, which are accessible, but also within your hospital, you can ask, what are the sort of statistics? What is my likelihood, say, of a significant tear with forceps? Mm -hmm. versus a cesarean mm -hmm. um, but if anything if you're worried about it getting to an instrumental birth you're wanting to do things before that to try and prevent that so that's being mobile in labor um, using yeah a lot of sort of positioning to get baby down um, getting an epi if you're wanting to get an epidural trying to wait that little bit later so you, you've progressed a bit further um, using things like a birthing stool yeah. to help you know open your pelvis um, but again, it, it's, it's doing your own research and making the decision before you're in there 10 centimetres and having to make the decision. Um, yeah, and looking at what you're most comfortable with. Yeah, okay. Um, so back again, we've got another one that's interested in more around the hypnobirthing and calm birthing. Yes. Jack is due to have her third child. Uh, she had mm. interventions with uh, her first, she was induced, and none with her second. She's keen to know more about calm birthing versus hypnobirthing and any other techniques to avoid medications or interventions this time around. Mm -hmm. So essentially, calm birthing and hypnobirthing are like different brands. Mm -hmm. um, so what you really want to do is see which sort of company that has values and procedures and programs that you most identify with, um, because they're each sort of trademarks and that's their main difference. Um, with calm birthing, that's more focused on mobility and things in labour, whereas hypnobirthing is more like a relaxation sort of um, really maintaining relaxation, whereas calm birth was created out of someone who had experienced hypnobirthing and was wanting to, you know, be calm no matter what circumstance. So people can use calm birth if they're having a planned cesarean. Mm -hmm. And women will find it very helpful and they'll take it into parenting. Um, 
but I feel like, again, they're all to do with that mentality, right, in labour. So the best thing is working on that, making sure you're feeling empowered, reading positive experiences. Um, and the information is out there if you're happy to, like, go and search for it. Um, yeah. So it's just about starting to research. Yeah, of course. Um, okay, we've got so many questions coming through and it's fantastic. Um, this has been the best response so far, this one. And <laughs> So good to have everybody with us tonight. Hopefully we can get through all of your questions and concerns. Um, so we'll just keep going with a couple of more. Um, we've got somebody who said, my baby is 13 months old and still no periods. No, I don't miss them. <laughs> Lucky you. Um, I'm still breastfeeding. I'm wondering when I should start getting worried. Mm -hmm. So I would definitely say that this is a great question for the GP, but it's not something to necessarily be concerned about. Breast, like breastfeeding can um, inhibit having your period. That's very normal, especially if you're exclusively breastfeeding and regularly doing it. Um, I would say, you know, the next time that you are visiting your GP to bring it up and start to look at options, but it's not necessarily something to like panic over straight away. It can be normal. Okay. We've had a couple of people uh, refer to cabbages tonight. Um, okay. So you mentioned in relation to breastfeeding. Um, yes. I've heard about using cabbages to help my boobs when breastfeeding. What is this? Does it really work? What do you use it for? So the main um, reason why cabbage leaves are used is for engorgement. So when your milk comes in, your breasts feel really sore and tight. Cabbage leaves can be great. You put them in the freezer, they fit sort of perfectly in your bra. They're the perfect shape to hold your breast yeah. um, and they can offer a, a lot of relief. They're a nice sort of soothing texture. In the same way in the hospital, we wet baby nappies and cut them in half and then put them into the um, bras because as they melt, they're not gonna sort of go everywhere. So it's really just a comfort option to help as that milk's coming in and everything's trying to equalize out. Gotcha. There we go. Cabbage trick. Um, okay, so we've got one from Christine here. Does perennial massage reduce the chance of perennial trauma? Can you recommend any other methods to prepare that muscle prior to labour? Yes. So research does say that perineal massage does reduce your risk of tearing. Um, and that research is mainly done around first time mums. Um, what I would say yeah, we recommend it to all women sort of starting from 32 weeks, whatever they're comfortable with. And if anything, it helps you sort of understand that stretching um, and that physio physiology behind getting baby out. Uh, there are things you can look into as well. Um, warm compress. So asking if your hospital doesn't already routinely place a warm compress on as the baby's crowning that can help a lot with comfort and reducing your risk of tearing um, there are other products on the market that you can look at one's called the epino some people have success with it some people actually cause themselves tears prior to birth from that and that's sort of like a balloon that inflates your perineum it's something to look into something to be aware of um, but i think the biggest thing would be the control as the baby's head's coming out. So if you, you can discuss with your doctor or your midwife, if you want hands on, so them helping you and helping guide the baby out and you communicating, or if you feel really in control to sort of breathe that baby out as we describe mm -hmm. and giving that perineum time to stretch is really what's going to, you know, help with that trauma. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so we've got one from Carol here. So she's 39 weeks pregnant. Um, congratulations for the baby. Oh, exciting. Very, very close. Um, who the baby has spun into breech position two weeks mm -hmm. ago. The ECV was unsuccessful. She still has lots of fluid around her. Have you ever seen a baby just spin into position on their own if labour begins naturally? Definitely, definitely. They do do it. They are very cheeky, those breech babies. Um, but there is a few things that you can continue to do up until labour. Um, so the biggest things would be, I would recommend spinning babies. So that's all accessible. You just type in spinning babies. They have a few exercises such as forward leaning inversions to try and turn baby around. People have success with reflexology, with um, acupuncture as well. 
Um, there are all things with rebozo sifting. So these are things that you can all sort of like just Google and you'll find a bunch of information come up. I'd say don't lose hope um, and talk to your care providers about your options because there are options for vaginal breech birth. Not every hospital offers it and it depends where you live. But if you're really determined to have a vaginal breech birth, I know the hospitals, the centres that allow that accept like referrals even from like in the country. Um, so it, it's knowing that you, you do have a lot of options and breach is a variation of normal and they can come out vaginally. Um, so it's considering that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we've got a, a couple uh, last ones. We'll just try and get through mm -hmm. this quickly there um, in relation cool. to, I guess, support garments for people. So um, do belly bands help with lower back pain? And also are recovery shorts worth investing in? How do they actually work? So again, it's all as, as you've got to sort of imagine physiologically, you've had this baby and everything sort of falling back into place. Your organs literally like go back into place. And some women even feel like a bit of like crazy sensations as things go back together. A lot of women will really helps and makes them from a belly band or sort of compression shorts and things like that. So they're definitely options to explore if you're feeling uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. That being said, they don't replace exercise and they don't replace um, sort of seeing a physio and things like that. A lot of hospitals will offer a physio class after birth. So making sure that you attend that um, is really important. But I would like trust yourself. Does that make sense? I'm feeling uncomfortable. I'm getting this back pain. These shorts help. You know, sometimes it is as easy as that. Um, because different things are going to work for different people. Yeah, of course. All right. Well, I think I think we've um, just about hit our time. Um, that's pretty much all we have time for. Um, I want to say a big thank you to everybody for joining us here again tonight. We are absolutely loving providing this information for our community and um, trying to, to help out where we can. Keep a look out tomorrow for our prize winner announcements. Thanks you, thank you to our partner, Tommy Tippy. Um, and for those who are interested to celebrate World Breastfeeding Week, they are running a week-long event on their socials um, this week filled with all things breastfeeding, including exclusive offers and giveaways and tips and advice and more. So you can head over to the Tommy Tippy Facebook page to find the event and we'll post it in the comments of this post as well. Tyler, once again, thank you so much for joining us and answering all of our questions. I, your knowledge is just incredible and we're so thankful for you for joining us once again. Thank you so much. This has been so fun. And I also want to thank all of you women who are seeking this information out and empowering yourselves. It's going to put you, you know, so ahead of everything, make you so much more comfortable just trying to seek this out and get curious about your body and your birth and your baby. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful night and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.